Hello, everyone. This is Barka Reddy, the Regional Director at APAC Assistance. Uh, today, we are here to discuss a little more about the recent accident which took away the life of the President of Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, President Raisi. Uh, a lot is being said in the media about how this happened, who could be behind such a high-profile death. Uh, joining us today to elucidate a uh, more technical knowledge, especially with his uh, aviation industry experience, is Gary Mahoney. Gary is a uh, co-founder and co-owner of Nomad Aviation and Precision Helicopters. Uh, Gary, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'll go. Uh, Gary, just to uh, kick off the uh, discussion, we now know that the helicopter crashed on the 19th of May, and this happened in the high mountainous region in northwestern Iran, along the border with uh, Azerbaijan. This area is not traditionally known to be highly tense politically or geopolitically, as it shares border, borders with Azerbaijan, uh, an allied country, uh, and the other side of the region is with uh, Turkey. However, the Topography is quite challenging. The crash apparently happened at an altitude of 7,000 feet. Uh, your take on this, your insights from your experience in the industry? Um, I, I can't speak to the, the political side of it, but uh, looking at the weather, from what I've, various videos I've seen, um, pictures, pictures of the site, and knowing a little bit about the Bell 212, I, I'd say it's more likely that it's been a technical uh, slash um, pilot error uh, type of accident. Um, it, it would seem on the surface that um, the, the, the kind of pilots that are going to be flying around the uh, any president of any country, generally they're pretty competent people. You, you don't get uh, you don't get to fly those kind of people around if you're uh, you know if you're not you don't have a degree of competency. Um, having said that, controlled flight into terrain can happen to um, uh, any um, any of us. It, it's a it's a something that happens. You know, there's probably on average two uh, flights a month um, where we have a, a controlled flight into terrain accidents, CFIT we call them, where uh, people uh, get into bad weather, um, either. Uh, they get into instrument conditions and they end up uh, with losing situational awareness. They're not sure exactly where they are. And instead of uh, being um, on, a, on a track between A and B where they think they are, they're actually, uh, uh, you know, off course and uh, they get themselves in amongst the hills and they can run into hills. Um, and... Uh, you know, particularly common uh, in bad weather. Um, there's been a rash of them um, in Indonesia over the years. Uh, a couple of years ago in the uh, east coast of Australia, there was three or four of them within about three months. So um, they're not location discriminatory. Um, it's pretty common uh, globally, these kind of accidents. The, two, the Bell 212 is generally a pretty reliable aircraft um, there's plenty of them around still flying and um, looked after. Uh, they, they run pretty well and, and they give a good uh, uh, service history. However, one of the issues with the 412 has always been its single engine performance. And given, you know, there was a flight of three and uh, two of the other aircraft made it to the destination uh, without any problems, I wonder whether... Um, They've been um, en route. They've had some kind of an engine problem um, with the Pratt & Whitney PT6-3B engines in them at around 7,000 feet with eight POB and uh, any reasonable amount of fuel, um, say 1,000 pounds, you know, 400 to 500 kilos of fuel. They will not maintain altitude on one engine. So... If the aircraft has had some kind of power problem on one engine, 
um, they will have had to descend. They would have no choice but to descend. And if the weather's been bad and they've not been able to see where they're, what they're descending into, uh, it's quite possible that, uh, you know, they've, they've had no choice but to descend and they've had to descend into uh, mountainous terrain and they've not been able to uh, pull off a successful landing. So, Gary, with over four decades of experience in the aviation industry as a veteran, how would you uh, how would you tackle such a scenario? It is over seven thousand uh, feet in altitude, and the helicopter in question is a twin engine Bell two twelve. Do you believe such uh, such an aircraft is capable enough to tackle uh, the altitude? When everything's working well for you. Um, the aircraft would be able to conduct the flight um, quite capably. You know, the, the issue comes is when you have a problem. And if you do have a power plant malfunction, either, uh, you know, a full engine, one engine fails uh, or it is limited on power, it, it will not maintain altitude at, at, on one engine, not with that kind of payload. So um, you're, you've got no option but to descend whether you like it or not. And it, do, it doesn't matter how many hours of experience you've got, how good a pilot you are. It's just one of those, it's a, a simple fact of, of uh, a function of horsepower um, and a payload. And, and in that particular circumstance, if one engine uh, did have a power problem, um, the, the bet, it's just going to come down to, to absolute luck that you're going to be able to get down through the cloud and find a place where you're going to be able to pull off a successful landing. Um, it's not the ideal. I would not have thought that for the leader of a, you know, a, a leader of a country, a president of a country, it would have been the ideal aircraft for that kind of flight and that kind of terrain, simply because of the lack of redundancy in the event of an engine failure. So, uh, Gary, the fleet, what Iranian Air Force uh, operates, is fairly old, and it's very well known that Iran is under prolonged sanctions. Uh, do you think that may have contributed to the poor maintenance uh, of its fleet, including this particular helicopter? Um, it's hard to it, it's hard to say. In regards to the maintenance that's been conducted on the aircraft, remembering that these kind of accidents have happened um, all over the world. Uh, technically speaking, the Iranians, you know, have been quite proficient. You know, they build their own rockets, they build rocket engines. Um, uh, you know, obviously their drone technology is quite good. Uh, they're, they're fairly technically uh, sound people, and and. You know, while these engines are old, it's quite possible that they have the means, they've found the means to uh, produce some of these parts for themselves or, you know, been able to work around the sanctions. So it would be quite difficult to comment on the state of the maintenance on the aircraft without kind of, you know, you'd obviously need a bit more information. Um, but sometimes you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you do have a problem in those kind of conditions, like I say, it, it doesn't matter whether you're in uh, northern Canada, uh, western USA, parts of Australia, middle of Africa, you know, the, the, the outcome of that problem is going to be the same, regardless of who's flying it and, and where you are. That's point well taken, Gary. And it needs to be noted that the cash site is between uh, Iran, Azerbaijan border and Tabriz, which which is part of the eastern uh, Azerbaijan province of Iran. Uh, it's fairly well known to be quite rugged in terms of its topography. And your point about it doesn't matter where it is, if the landscape is challenging, uh, it will be difficult to manage. Uh, but at the same time, um, the, the, there is also a question being raised about high profile nature of such uh, such an accident. How is that only the president's helicopter gets uh, gets into a snag, either technical or because of, uh, you know, pilot ever in such a difficult condition. Uh, apparently, there was an issue of fog and rain uh, it, on Sunday when it actually happened. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, yeah uh, I mean, 
these aircraft are non-discriminatory when it comes to the passengers on board them. <laughs> you know, uh, they don't... Often you hear these various aircraft are described too with personalities. People give them names um, and speak of them as though they are uh, human, you know, that they have human tendencies that, you know, uh, she's a good old girl. It'll look after me. It'll get me to the, the final site. But these aircraft are non-discriminatory. They don't care whether you're the president of Iran. They don't care if you're a billionaire. Um a tech billionaire out of the United States. I mean, these things uh, are, they're, they're machines. And these kind of accidents happen to, you know, rich people, poor people, uh, presidents, you know, non-presidents alike. And so it, it could have been that this was just his, that, that this was just his day. Um, and the aircraft had a problem. Um, like I said, it would seem unlikely to me that the pilots, given their, you know, given who their passengers were, um, given um, their job at hand, that they would have screwed up so badly that they got themselves into bad weather and um, became disoriented and uh, ended up as uncontrolled flight into terrain. Um, and, and so what happens in a circumstance like that is a, a typically a non-instrument rated pilot would fly under the cloud. Um, they would become spatially disoriented. So when you, uh, so when you're flying a helicopter, basically you're you're relying on your the sensors knowing where your horizon is to keep you upright. When you fly under cloud and you you don't have a fixed horizon, the, the human mind starts playing tricks on you, and the and you've got uh, about 56 seconds for an untrained instrument pilot when you fly into the cloud and you can't see a rise. You have about 56 seconds before you will lose control of the aircraft and crash into the ground. Um, it, it doesn't matter how much experience you have. Um, unless you have training on instrument flight, how to fly the aircraft in relation to, to instruments, um, you know, it will, it will happen that quick. And it's almost universal. Some people go a little longer. Some people don't go that long at all. But it's generally considered to be about 56 seconds. Like I say, it would seem, given the passenger, um, that these the pilots that were flying that aircraft, you know, would would almost certainly be instrument rated uh, and, and, and competent instrument pilots. So the uncontrolled... The theory of an uncontrolled uh, flight into terrain, you know, doesn't sit that well with me. Um, and so it comes back to there's been some kind of a technical problem. You know, they've not had enough power to maintain altitude and have been forced to descend into into hostile terrain. Uh, um, and then... The sabotage side of it, you know, one would think that those aircraft are pretty well, uh, you know, pr pretty secure, that there would be guards uh, positioned around them. Yes. Uh, in fact, you know, someone's just going to walk up and a brake line or something like that. It just seems to be a little far-fetched. There would have to be a pretty major security protocol. And given the situation in the world at the moment, you know, it, I would think that their security people would be right on the, on the top of their games at the moment, you know, given the, you know, the embassy bombings in, um, in Syria and, and things like that. You know, one would think that they'd be pretty, well on top of the game at, in that respect. Yes, uh, I would agree with uh, with that, Gary, because the flight was within the allied territory or within the uh, within the confines of sovereign territory of Iran, and they were going from Kiz Dam integration after inaugurating the Kiz Dam with on the border with Azerbaijan to their regional capital that is Tabriz. So it is not one of those hostile border areas. Uh, like with the hostile border with uh, Syria or, or um, 
or Israel. Um, uh, Gary, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, no, yeah, like I said, I think I've pretty much covered everything as, as um, I can think of it. Um, it just seemed to me it's more likely to be some kind of technical issue that's forced them um, to descend into hostile terrain. Uh, and like I say, these mechanical failures are non-discriminatory. They don't care uh, who's on board the aircraft. And, and there's been enough of them over the years. You know, um, Kobe Bryant is a good example of an aircraft accident. Uh, that was an uncontrolled flight into terrain. The pilot climbed up through the cloud, um, didn't maintain his reference to the flight instruments, lost control of the aircraft, crashed into the ground. Now, the aircraft did not care that Kobe Bryant was a, a world-famous sportsman or, or a billionaire. And so these things happen. And, uh, and, and then as far as the you know, the sabotage side of it, you know, while it's possible, it just seems unlikely, you know, given the location. And it, it would seem to me, uh, it, given the 212 is well known for having very poor uh, single engine performance, um, you know, it would seem more likely that there's been some kind of technical issue and they've been forced to just, you know, clearly was foggy. You're just not going to see the mountains come up in front of you. And, you know, by the time you do, you're at uh, you're at such a forward speed that there's just nothing you can do about it. You know, you, you're it's really going to come down to luck that you hopefully pop out in a in a in a valley somewhere and you've got enough time to to spot a place and put it down. But uh, you know, it's not often you get that lucky in those kind of situations. Uh, and like I say, th these things are non-discriminatory. They just don't care who's on board. Um, and and like there's so there's so many of these accidents um, that you know it. Uh, there was one in Indonesia recently in uh, Sulawesi, a uh, white sky aviation for uh, the nickel mining company over there in Sulawesi. Um, uh, they were in a Bell four two nine, quite a modern aircraft with uh, you know good single engine performance and. and and a good suite of avionics, autopilots, things like that. But when you're not prepared for instrument flight, the shock of going uh, what we call inadvertent AMC is quite uh, confronting. You know, it's a it's quite startling, and you have to be uh, really on your game to be able to uh, engage your pilot, um, figure out a flight routing, particularly if you're amongst the hills, um, and get the aircraft stabilized and get it to a place where you think you can pull that down. Um, you know, and, and often people panic. You know, people panic and they forget to fly the aircraft, which is funny as it sounds, but um, there was an Air Asia accident uh, between um, um, uh, Eastern Java there heading to... Um, Singapore a few years ago, um, the co-pilot, uh, sorry, captain went down the back and for whatever reason, an inexplicable reason, he uh, turned off the flight computers to reset them for a problem there. He didn't have to touch anything. And the aircraft crashed because the lifetime uh, pilot, uh, who was the co-pilot, couldn't fly the airplane, had lost control of it, uh, was not able to maintain uh, his horizon on the standby uh, attitude indicator in the aircraft, high speed stalled, spun, killed 180 people on board. And so sometimes it's just the shock factor. Um, and, and like I say, it's just uh, sadly, it's all too, um, it's all too common. Thank you for that. Uh, we uh, we appreciate you taking the time at a short notice. Uh, we will send you a copy of this recording uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Bago.